So we are here today in All About Words premises. We have a special guest. Her name is Jeannie Michaud. She's my friend and she's a writer. She was born in uh, Virginia, but now lives in Colorado. And part-time, she resides in Los Cabos. So welcome, Jeannie. It's a great pleasure to have you. Jeannie Michaud is a climate speaker, writer, author of climate fiction, conservationist, and explorer. She's a member of the Explorers Club and has headed their conservation committee. Her extensive travels in the Arctic and Antarctica help her prepare to write her new novel, A Tree for Antarctica. Her passion is working to mitigate the effects of climate change for the sake of future generations. So Jeannie and I, share a common interest for writing and as well for traveling. But our trips don't only involve knowing new places, but really researching about them. Her novel, A Tree for Antarctica, who was published last year, 2021, during the summer, tells us a story that happens in the future. And it's very important because it talks about climate change, which is a real important topic nowadays. Everybody's talking about it. So um, I would like to welcome Jeannie and let her talk about her new novel. Oh, thank you, thank you. We're both time travelers, it looks like. <laughs> yes, we do. And I'm so interested in your time. This is, I can't wait to read the English edition, which is just out, right? Yes, it's, it's just out. right now. Yes, as we speak. I can't wait to read that. It's, it's, a, it's going to be wonderful, I know because she sent me a few snippets early on. And, yeah. Uh, but, but my novel is set in the future, hers is set a couple hundred years in the past, not quite the same time distance, but similar. Apart. Similar, yeah. Yeah. So we have to imagine what people are like then, what they think, how they talk, and all the rest of it. And, yes. Uh, but mine is to try to introduce people now to the issues of climate change. I used to give a lot of talks. I've given hundreds of talks all over the place. And in Cabo, in fact, I gave five or six talks and one radio talk in years past. But um, now I'm just writing because that's, the, that's what I like doing. And I thought that a novel would introduce people to enjoy a story and learn through reading it for that reason, you know, rather than just being taught that educationally. Yes, that's true. It's very interesting um, as well in my own uh, novel. Even if it's a lot of uh, historical information and data, then obviously I created a fiction because in that way you're reading a story. People like to listen to stories. Yes. And as they are learning, they're enjoying as well. So I think it's yes. a very nice way, a very brilliant way for you to bring everyone to what we need to know about climate change, which is, it's really an important topic, I think. I know that it has taken you 18 years to write the novel, which many people would say, well, that's a lot. Well, that's a lot because Jeannie has researched a lot and she has many people that supported her and aided her uh, to write it on the scientific uh, side, right? Can you right. tell us more about it, Jeannie? Yes, I was really fortunate to meet scientists all along the way mm -hmm. when we would travel. Uh, I made a point to meet scientists and even government officials, such as in Bhutan. I spoke with the Ministry uh, Director of Ecology in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. And I wow. made a point to meet people like that and ask them what are the important factors about climate change in your area. But then the, the people who really taught me a lot were the scientists who appeared on 60 Minutes with Scott Pelley, whom I uh, traveled with to some locations while they were sh doing shoots for the 60 Minutes TV show. And also scientists I just met through the Explorers Club and through my travels. Most of the places I went were not places people go for fun. They were <laughs> places people go to do science. That's but true. But it was fun to me, and I loved <laughs> doing all of it. I would like to see a picture of you hiking in the Arctic or 
Even Antarctica. Yeah. I was so close to Antarctica when I went to Cape Horn. I say oh, so yes. close because it's not really far away, but it was scary. Somebody said, uh, would you like to continue the trip to Antarctica? I said, well, no, probably next time, <laughs> which probably I can go with you because you're yes, an expert now. I would now. love to go with you. That would be fun. <laughs> Although it is hard. You do have to prepare. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. One thing that took 18 years about this book is that yeah. I had to keep re-editing it for many reasons. First, I was learning to write, but beyond that also because the science was changing as we go along. And uh, scientists would learn new things. I'd want to put them in the book. So that's why it really took a long time to get it done. As you're traveling, you're learning, and then you're adding up to the novel. And it, well, mine took two years, but mine is just a story that is an old story, 300 years ago. Nothing is changing. It's just research of things that are on stone. But as for the future, there's more research every time and you might change an, a, a chapter because they discovered something else and then you have a hint or something different, right? Yeah. So um, I began to read your book. It's just, uh, it just kept me busy for a couple, couple of hours and I had to continue my errands during the day. But I wish it for tonight. Okay. It's a very gripping story. And if you could tell us without spoiling it, What's the story about um, in gener generally? Well, sure. It's about um, a young person who really is not that young. He's 30, and he's been a rescue pilot. Mm -hmm. But he wants to leave that work, and he wants to uh, do something that's a little bit safer. So he takes a job he thinks is going to be safe, and which will also help him uh, cut down the CO2 in the Earth's, at Earth's atmosphere, which is way beyond what it should be, and way beyond right now as well. But we are headed there, I'm sorry to say, but hopefully we will not get there. That's the point of this book. We want everybody to be encouraged to not get to this, this book's level of CO2 in the atmosphere and the damages it causes. But he sets out on this expedition that has many adventures along the way, and he has a love story. He wants to get home to marry his old girlfriend, Anna. Uh -huh. And so it, it's got a lot of things to carry you through for fun while at the same time being sort of a treatise on the future, given no change in our carbon dioxide emissions. Yes, I've read about like two chapters and I'm really learning words, new words for the first time. Um, and I keep up with the story, but it blends very well. You cannot tell if you're learning or just having fun, but both things are happening at the same time. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> that makes me happy because that's the point. Yeah, yeah that's good. really great. Yeah, Thank that's you. the thing of being a good writer. So have you ever thought of translating it into other languages? For example, Spanish? Spanish, that would be number one. <laughs> I'd love it, to. I, and being here with you makes me want to do it even more because you've just translated your book into English. Yes. And I tried reading it in Spanish. My Spanish is not good enough to really <laughs> read it as deeply as I want to. So I'm very excited to see the English edition. Yes, it would be. Um, yeah, I'll give it to you shortly. And uh, as we're talking... I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I would love to buy it. It's yes. going to be in Amazon in a couple yeah. of days, but... Good. This book is, is really good reading anytime. I'm thank excited. You. Thank you, thank you. I think you will enjoy the, the novel. It goes fast as the wind pushes the sails of your vessel. Then um, you, you'll learn more about the place you reside because you are in Cabo yes. San Lucas some of the time, right? I can't wait to read about Cabo. And the fact that it's set partly here is a real draw. There's a lot of stories about pirates and privateers who came to the waters of Cabo San Lucas mm -hmm. or Cape San Lucas. but when I realized one of those privateers was Alexander Selkirk, who was the inspiration for Daniel Defoe to write Robinson Crusoe, then I decided to stop thinking about biographies and just dedicate a special book, a particular book for Alexander Selkirk. I think we have to make him famous because Robinson Crusoe is famous all over the world for generations, through generations of people, he's famous. So he was, was he actually um, saved by pirates? Yes, um, Alexander Selkirk was um, abandoned in an island through an expedition that came out from England in the 1703. And he decided he was 
going to remain in Juan Fernandez. It's an island in Chile, in the coast of Chile. And because the vessel, uh, he thought the vessel was going to be shipwrecked. So he decided to land and the captain left. He regret, but then he couldn't do nothing. The English were just miles away. So he stayed there for four years and four months. And obviously he survived. And in 1709, another group of privateers who were coming from England rescued him from Juan Fernandez Island. They were going on the chase of the Manila Galleon. You know, Philippines was a colony, a Spanish colony mm -hmm. from the 1500s to the 1800s. And they were the most important archipelago in Asia for the trade. So they got the goods from China, from India, from Persia, from uh, Japan, and they loaded these huge vessels to cross to America, mainly to the port of Acapulco. But Acapulco is south of Cape San Lucas, and they, um, these vessels coming from Philippines, they needed to stop in Cape San Lucas, not because they wished to, because the ocean currents drove them to San Lucas. I mean, when you're in Philippines and you want to sail to America, you have to take the current up north of Japan, Kuroshio current, and then you take to the right on the north um, current, and then the California current, which will take you south of Cape San Lucas. So that's why the Manila Galleon came to Los Cabos. And obviously the, the British, they knew and they were hiding in the beach, near the beach, the Medano Beach, which is oh, a bay, yes. ah. until ah. The, the big treasure of the seas arrived. And then they hunted the vessel. They didn't mean to destroy the vessel, but to capture it, board it, and take it all the way back to England. What did they do with all the people on the vessel? And this particular pirate who rescued Selkirk, whose name was Good Rogers, he was not a really criminal or violent pirate. He let them go. Okay. He let them go and he just took the loot to England. He was authorized by the Queen then. Oh to yes. Do these things. Yes, we we can call them privateers, not pirates, because yeah. they will get <laughs> mad if we if they listen to us. They used to have these letters of mark. They were authorized to, to loot because at that time the war of succession was happening. So Spain and France were allied and England was their enemy as well as Holland. Mm. So the, the Queen issued those permits to help her country to win a war because England also wanted possessions. And you know, yes. Portugal and Spain had divided the world since the 1600s or even the 1500s, they divided the world. It's fascinating because Thank there you. are no markers, there's no building there's nothing here to show what was very interesting history yeah well thank you thank you uh Jeannie, it was a pleasure to have you today pleasure for me too mm -hmm. and i look forward for a second conversation with you after i read your book and you read my book oh, great so we'll do it thank you